welcome to Massive Late Fee. And now your hosts, Mark and Carol. Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Massive Late Fee. My name is Mark. With me as always is my girlfriend, Carol. How are you doing, Carol? Hey, what's up? Well, not much. We've had a good week here at Massive Late Fee. It is October 15th, 1994. And there isn't much in the news today. I have to say that. Hmm. So basically, the <laughs> this is a very a very local story, but I will read just the beginning uh, from the the Detroit Free Press. Guillermo Gomez Pena wants to guide you. Call. One three one three eight three three seven eight eight four to hear what he has to offer. That's okay. Speaking provocatively, in lulling cadences of uh, Spanish accented English, he suggests that Motor City citizens experiencing spiritual emptiness, racial fear, sexual loneliness, and political confusion can find to- total cultural satisfaction. So this guy's a performance artist and he says two real live Mexicans will be at the DIA this weekend for you to meet and talk to. And basically he says that anyone that wants to unburden themselves of anything should either call him and talk to him or talk to them in person, the Mexican people. Uh, You know, anytime you felt that you felt like, The black, like you didn't like the black delivery guy or you were afraid of him just simply because he was black, any political stuff, a lot of racial stuff. And I guess the, the goal is to kind of start a dialogue and break down stereotypes and things like that. Okay. That's what I believe is the goal of the whole thing. So he is at the DIA. Yes. And is encouraging people to come and talk about racism. Correct. Yes. Interesting. It's weird because there there's not a big Mexican population around here, but there is a Mexican population around here. Yes, there is. So it's not as if seeing a Mexican person is unheard of. Yeah, I mean, this doesn't really sound like performance art. This sounds like politics. Well, I, I think the performance art about it is that they're, it's I don't know. They're staging themselves as an interactive art piece, basically. It's very weird. It is uh, very strange. There, there's also a there's a what's the word I'm looking for? A feature on the fact that uh, Miss Miss Saigon is coming to the Masonic Temple Theater. Okay, and. Then there's a feature on Darren, or D- I'm sorry, uh, Dar- Darnell, I guess, Darnell Martin, who's a woman, the first uh, black woman to direct a major motion picture. Huh. And the the article points out that other black females have directed pictures before Just Another Girl, uh, Daughters of the Dust, Dry White Season. But uh, Martin is being paid $5 million because this is a major motion picture from Columbia. Wow. And I guess so I'm trying to figure I'm trying to see what she's directing. It doesn't, doesn't say what movie she's directing, but uh, good for her. That is cool. And I mean, that's basically the news for this week. There's not, there's not a whole lot going on outside of what we're going to actually be talking about today. Mm -hmm. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of news. So, well, we do have some, uh, some speaking from the heart things to look at today though. Oh, massive love. All right. So this week I've given the the paper over to Carol. Carol's going to find some, some juicy bits for us from the, the lonely hearts over here. So let's start with, um, try this special guy. Okay. It's like a, like, like a supermarket sample. Right? (laughs) 
Divorced white male, 49, Uh. ambitious, seeks sincere woman with sense of humor for dining, dancing, plays, movies, travel, and all fall activities. So uh, he only wants he only wants to date in the fall, right? Or he only does things outside in the fall. <laughs> I don't go boating, right? Oh yeah, winter's coming. Forget it. <laughs> you want to build a snowman? Not with this guy, right? Do you want to build a snowman? Hey, that'd be a good song. <laughs> that would be a nice little winter tune. Yeah. <laughs> um, look at him looking. I know I saw some stuff in here earlier. Sex is not all I need. Okay. Good for you. Um, This is a woman then? (laughs) No, actually. White male, 46. Outgoing, cute, clean, of course. Of course. Slender. Seeks similar female for occasional no strings fulfilling relationship. So wait a minute. (laughs) So all he's looking for is sex. But it's not all he needs. But what is, so maybe he's saying, come over and play canasta. No strings. (laughs) Right? <laughs> so weird. I want to play Jeopardy with someone. <laughs> yeah, um, no strings does mean, it has to mean sex. You would think so. Seniors. Oh, bi, high school seniors? By white male, 38. What? Yeah, he's looking for high school seniors. <laughs> No, go ahead. Um, five foot eight, one hundred and sixty pounds. Desires meeting healthy, tall black male, over sixty five. So this thirty eight year old oh, oh, oh. wants a daddy. Interesting. That is weird. Yep, over sixty five. Movie dinner fun times. Over sixty it has to be over sixty five. So he wants an old dude. <clears throat> So movies. Oh, that means like old dude Dick turns this guy on. Movies. Dinner at three p.m. Right? Maybe he just maybe he just wants some early bird specials. He's looking for in movies too. He's looking for senior discounts. Oh my god, you're right. <laughs> uh, he's just cheap. I don't want to pay full <laughs> price. If I'm gonna have a gay relationship, I'm not paying full price for it. Makes sense. Yeah. So this one says tall. That's how the ad starts. That's all? Tall. In, in in all caps, tall, handsome, clean, attractive, white male. How tall must you be right. to put the fact that you're tall in all caps? But they don't actually put how tall they are. Oh, wow. That's a little frightening. Like, Use yeah, how tall are you? Are you like seven feet tall? Or more. Who knows? It's Andre the Giant. Right. Um. So, a clean, attractive, <laughs> white male, 36, solitary. I'm a clean, attractive, white male. <laughs> This guy says solitary recluse. What? (laughs) He's a solitary recluse or he's looking for one? Okay, no. he Okay, tall, handsome, clean, attractive white male, 36, solitary recluse, independently financially secure. So he he works at home or works from home or just inherited a bunch of money? Well, when they say independently financially secure, I think it means that you don't work. Yeah, so he's just he's got a bunch of money in the bank. Seeks younger, attractive, slightly distant female companion. What? <laughs> <laughs> to share. I want someone aloof. Right? To share discreet or non discreet experiences. Oh my gosh, somebody who doesn't want to be discreet for once. Right. So, what, what are you going to do? Shout it from porn? the rooftops. Hey, I got all day to fuck, so. Um, this sounds like someone who's trying to replace their mom. Ew. I mean, when you th- like that's very or re- okay, maybe not, maybe not that gross, but trying to replace some other relationship, maybe another girlfriend or or a wife who died or something like that. When you're that specific and you're saying, "I want someone that's a, that's slightly distant," yeah, that's describing someone you knew already. Well, and the fact that he's a recluse, I mean, yeah. That could be why he wants someone slightly distant because he's used to being alone and he doesn't want somebody who's going to be around all the time. I guess. I mean, you could, if that's what he wanted, you could easily just say non clingy. Right. Yeah, very weird. And finally, I found one in the entertainment section. Okay. This just made me laugh. Temporarily yours. <laughs> tantalizing blondes and more so other colors right 
What what is it about blondes? Like, why do people think that blondes are so much hotter than anyone else? I don't know. I, blonde hair is not that attractive to me, so I don't know. But it it seems to be like the expectation that blondes are hot, even if they're not. Yeah, I don't know where that came from at all. Maybe at some point a bunch of Norwegians came over to the United <laughs> States and it was exotic and all the guys were like, wow, that's 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 the best. Maybe. I don't know. It's very strange to be. I mean, now I'm not just saying this because I'm a brunette. I, I, I'm just, I don't get it. Like, I wouldn't dye my hair blonde. I don't, I mean, some girls are blonde and pretty, but some blondes aren't pretty. Like, it yeah. just shouldn't matter. I mean, everyone has types. Mm-hmm. For sure, but meh. Yeah, I agree. Meh. Meh. <laughs> well, that's, so that's massive love, huh? That's massive Those love. Those were some pretty good selections. Maybe I'll have you do that again. <laughs> I try. So, uh, now it's, let's, let's go with, uh, let's go with this first. This is Jennifer Aniston, now friends on NBC. Except we're not on NBC, we're. We're on massive life, <laughs> but we, we will talk friends first. Yes. So this episode was pretty interesting. Actually, we got to learn a little bit more about Ross. You and, thought that it was interesting. Oh, you did not. You thought it was boring. It was annoying. There were several things that annoyed me about this episode. Yeah. First and foremost, I'm kind of getting sick of them having a clever conversation in that that coffee shop that they hang out in all the time to begin every episode. This episode, they were talking about being omnipotent. Right. <laughs> and, you know, what you would do if you were omnipotent. And Chandler says that he would he would make himself omnipotent forever if he was omnipotent for a day. Mm-hmm. So everyone's annoyed about that. And then Joey comes in and they ask him and he says he'd probably kill himself because he's mistaking it because he's the dumb one, I guess, for being impotent, (laughs) which he indicates by saying, if little Joey is dead, then what reason do I have to live? That's such a sad statement. Like, what you got to have some other shit in your life, man. So then Ross says, no, omnipotent. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> it was kind of funny. It's it's a funny moment, but it's it's a little annoying. Just every episode beginning the exact same way. Let's have a clever conversation around here. And it's just, it's a little too cute and a little too clever. They, they're good writers, but it feels like showing off kind of. And it's also a little boring when every episode begins that way. But here's the thing. You laughed, didn't you? Yes, it was funny. That's the point. I mean, as long as they're still making you laugh, does it really matter if they're doing it the same way every time? If it got to the point where it was no longer funny, then I could see complaining. Yeah, I suppose. But it just, I wish they would, I wish there was a little more creativity. I wish they'd mix things up a little bit. I guess. I mean, that's what the rest of the episode's for. But, yeah, I guess. So the guys come in and they say, hey, Ross, for your birthday, we got three tickets to the Rangers game. So we're going to go see the the New York Rangers play hockey. And Ross says that his birthday was seven months ago. Right. And the we get, the, we get an actual date, October 20th. So that's obviously, you know, about a week from now. In, you know, like in actuality. Right. But he says, my, my, my birthday was seven months ago. So that means that he was born in March. Sure. Like late March, maybe early. Good math. Maybe early April. Anyway, so I, I just thought that was interesting. So, um, I just find it weird that they would go in with the pretense that it's his birthday, not knowing, obviously, when his birthday is. Like that just I think they do dumb. know when his birthday is. So why? What, were they just joking? Was this supposed to be funny? Yeah, I think it was a joke. Oh, okay. But He seems so serious about telling them that they were wrong, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, but he does figure out that they, they couldn't figure out who to bring, which one of them could bring a date, because they... They had three tickets. I don't know why they got an extra ticket. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. But anyway, 
So they he realizes that this was the day that he first had sex with Carol, which not not my Carol. <laughs> yeah, sorry, David Schwimmer, but no, his his Carol in the parlance of the show. But Monica knows this, by the way. She says, "I was hoping that you wouldn't remember." Who, yeah, that's pretty weird. Who tells their sister that? Like the exact day, and she remembers the day. Because maybe they've celebrated it, like an anniversary. That is so weird. I mean, it seems very important to him. It's, and I guess, you know, we can spoil things, because we're just talking about the episode, and presumably you've seen the episode. Because what else would you be doing? Right. But, I, you know, even considering the fact that, as we find out later, this was his first time ever, so he lost his virginity to Carol who is the only woman he's ever slept with. Good for him. But even even finding that out, who celebrates that? It's so weird. <laughs> it is pretty strange. They could have just as easily made this their anniversary. Either their wedding anniversary or their or the anniversary of the first time they dated, like their first date. Yeah, but I think that it wouldn't have been as funny. I think they were trying to make it funny. It, it was wasn't annoying. Funny. It was it annoying. It was annoying. Yeah. But I think that's what they're going with because it would have been understandable for him to be upset if it was his wedding anniversary mm-hmm. or even the first date anniversary or whatever. But since no one else really gives a shit about when the first time is they had sex, it makes it more Ross specific. I guess, but it's so weird to just go around talking about that with your friends. Oh, Carol wore these boots. Yeah, that gives you like a mental image that you don't really need. Until she took them off. She's kind of hot, the actress that plays Carol. So, Well, we all know how you feel about her. (laughs) I guess it's okay because I am kind of picturing her in nothing but boots. and Yeah. Um, (laughs) But then I'm picturing him with her and that's not as hot. Right. That's true. You have to picture yourself with her. I could do that. But it's just, it's a weird thing to talk about with a bunch of other people. For sure. Just walking around town like, oh, this, we did the, they ate nectarines. Right. Who gives a shit? Yeah, exactly. Hey, do you remember what we ate the night we first had sex? No, I Me don't. Me either. Because you know what? That wasn't an important aspect of the evening. Right. But it's... The one thing, the one joke they get out of it that's funny, because I agree with you. The rest of the time, I was just feeling annoyed, mm-hmm. like like Ross or not Ross, like Chandler and Joey were. But what the one joke they got out of it that was funny was when at the be- very beginning, when Ross says, "You know, I, I better I better skip the game. I'm just gonna go home and think about my ex wife." With her lesbian lover. And Joey says, screw the game. Let's all do that. (laughs) Yeah, that was pretty good. That's the one joke they got out of it that was funny. The rest of it, you know, he could have easily just reminisced like it was the anniversary. Oh, she was wearing these boots on our first date or or whatever. You know, they they could have had the they could have the same things could have played out for sure. But yeah, if they were going for funny, this is a rare miss for them. It wasn't funny. Well, and then later they're talking and, and you know, it, it, he lets them know that she's the only one he's ever been with, right? Right, yeah. And so then Joey makes the joke of, forget hockey, there are lots of things we could have done tonight. Right. So, I mean, they got a couple things out of it. I guess, yeah. I mean, that was sort of funny. I didn't really laugh at that, but. Yeah, but it was a joke. Right. So, the other thing that happens in this episode is that Rachel's friends come. Uh, and they're just like you would imagine, <laughs> stereotypical upper crust New York women. And yeah. they, they do a lot of screaming. They remind me of high school girls, not women. Yeah, well, I think that's, I think they're supposed to be maybe very early 20s, like 21, 22, something like that. Right. That's my guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, the one just got made partner in her dad's law firm. That seems early. No, I think her her boyfriend or husband did. I thought, oh, really? I think that's what it was, yeah. Oh, that makes more sense. She was, like, dressed, though, more like lawyer E. It know. could have been her. Maybe I misunderstood, but I thought she was talking about whoever she's with. It makes, I mean, because then, like, you know, Rachel's talking about how everybody she knows is either getting 
pregnant or promoted right. or oh yeah i guess you're right i guess it was probably her because the one was pregnant the one was in like pretty clearly pregnant the mm-hmm. one was just got engaged and i guess yeah she just got promoted from you know by her dad and if rachel <laughs> if rachel had you know followed her plan she right. would have just gotten married yep. and they all would have had a thing but now she's just got her first job yeah, exactly. Which is also an accomplishment. I guess so. But yeah, she and that's the other thing that's sort of weird about this. So you would assume she gets paid either every week or every two weeks, right? Yeah. So even though we're, I believe, what, four or five episodes into this, this show? This is the fourth episode. So it's only been in the in the part in the 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 universe of the show, it's only been either a week or two weeks since she basically first came in and left that guy at the altar. Sure. I'm going to say two weeks. I'll, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. It's a lot has happened. I would say period. three weeks actually. Oh, this is the fourth episode. But what I'm saying is she just got paid. This is her first paycheck. That and does she started make that sense. job. She started the job. The first episode. It does make sense because if it's three weeks since she started the job, a lot of times there's like a delay of like a week. And then if you get paid like biweekly. All right. I guess you're defeating me with logic. (laughs) Sorry. So, I mean, we're going to use logic. We might as well get rid of the whole show. No. (laughs) But anyway, so she's upset because she doesn't know what FICA is. (laughs) Who is FICA and why did he get all my money? Right. So... And by the way, she can't be in that high of a tax bracket. Well, but I mean, if you have like no money, it hurts too. Yeah, I guess that's true. So she, you know, she's upset about that. And she doesn't, as you pointed out, she doesn't have a plan anymore. She doesn't know what she's going to do. And Phoebe her she lives with her grandmother and her grandmother has a new boyfriend and they're having loud sex because they're deaf. Yeah, it's kind of gross. So she's not getting much sleep. So Monica invites her to sleep over at their apartment. Mm-hmm. And they kind of turn it into like a slumber party type thing. And, and Rachel brings them all down. Yeah. By basically saying, well, none of us have a plan and we're all losers. <laughs> what is the tenor of what she's saying? I, I want Phoebe's pajamas, though, just side note. Like, she has yeah. cool, like, grown-up footy pajamas. Yeah, those those were cool looking. <laughs> so they order a pizza. The pizza guy gets there, and for some reason, he, he, or for no reason, he reads out what's on the pizza. And they say, no, that's not our pizza. And he's like, oh, you're not G. Stephanopoulos. Now, let's not just run over here what they ordered. Yeah, okay. Fat-free crust with extra cheese. Uh-huh. What the hell? What the hell, ladies? Come on. I, yeah, I don't get that either. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. What's fat-free crust, by the way? I don't know. I've never heard of such a thing. It must be a New York thing. I mean, I wouldn't think that pizza crust would have that much fat in it anyway. Most of the fat's coming from the cheese, and if you get any meat or anything like that on it, I would assume. Well, I mean, some pizza crust is kind of greasy. But does that come from the crust? I don't know. Anyway, so they, uh, yeah, that's what they order. But they get a mushroom and it sounded disgusting. Mushroom, green pepper and something. Ugh, yeah. Very, very vegetable-y It should have been, he's Greek, so it should have been like feta cheese. (laughs) Ooh, feta cheese on pizza sounds good. But anyway, so it's obviously George Stephanopoulos, the press secretary, I believe, was his was his job in or his job for the the thing the thing yeah i don't know <laughs> he he's like on the tv about oj all the time right no 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 not at all oh <laughs> i don't know i he's, don't know where we're supposed to know him from he's he's the white house press secretary okay i'm pretty sure or he was i don't i don't know i don't follow much of it but anyway, you've probably seen him. Maybe they made a statement about OJ. I don't know. Maybe. But anyway, so he works for the Clinton campaign or he worked for the Clinton campaign or he works with the Clintons or something like that. 
Okay. But anyway, a lot of women think he's cute. He's a very tiny looking guy. Like very small Greek guy. It's weird. Well, apparently they think he's cute anyway. Yeah. So they're like, oh, we got his pizza. He's across the street. So they get binoculars. First of all, they have binoculars right by the window. Well, yeah. Which is weird. Weren't they weren't they using them to ow. Sorry. <laughs> That is weird. That's very creepy. Uh-huh. But anyway, so they they look across and they see him. And so they see him with another woman, though, which crushes them. <laughs> and then they start to fantasize about what he's like and everything. I don't know. This Does this seem like a slumber party type thing? Because yes. I'm, I'm not familiar with female slumber parties. Well, I mean, it seems like not as fun of a slumber party as it would have been if Rachel hadn't been in a bad mood. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, at first they were having rum punch. Oh, yeah, that's right. And um, they had a bowl of cookie dough, and they were going to play Twister. Yeah. And that sounded really fun. That does sound fun. And instead, they end up eating pizza, drinking rum punch, and stalking George Stephanopoulos. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty much what happens. (laughs) But, yeah, I could definitely see girls doing that, sure. So the guys go to their hockey game. And basically, all that happens there is that Ross gets hit in the head with a puck. In the face. Like, his nose gets broken or something. Yeah, right in his nose. So they go to the ER, and there's a horrible uh, nurse there that's just acting a fool. Well, I don't think that... She was like a desk clerk. She was dressed like a nurse? I don't know. She called it her ER. I think she's just like an intake nurse. Okay, well, she was definitely not nice. But, yeah, so he's got to wait. Eventually he gets seen. He gets his face all taped up, and then some kid had taken his puck. (laughs) So he goes to grab it, and it flies out and hits this nurse in the face. So she gets her comeuppance. Right. Which is fine. And I guess at the end it's supposed to be like, well, everything's going to be okay kind of thing. For him, I don't know. He gets a laugh out of it. He gets right. a laugh out of maiming another human being. <laughs> and then, like a sociopath. And then, <laughs> and then the, at the, the very end, the little coda that's on every one of these episodes, the, the denouement, they, uh, they're they playing Twister. And Rachel's credit card company calls. They had called earlier oh, because yeah. she wasn't using her card. They wanted to see if she was okay. That's so messed up. So they call again, and she says, yeah, I'm okay and everything. And then she says, I have magic beans, which is a reference to a story that Phoebe told earlier when she was trying to cheer Rachel up before Rachel brought everyone down about how, I don't know what exactly what point she was trying to make out of it. But, yeah. but anyway, it's like the Jack and the Beanstalk thing. And she's looking at all her friends, and she's basically saying, like, you know, I'm fine. And she says, she actually says literally, I'm fine. But the the whole point is supposed to be that she's got these people that love her around her, and she's going to be okay. Yeah, it's kind of sweet. Sweet and hopeful. Nice ending of an episode. Yeah. So that was Friends. Now, Carol. Mm-hmm. We also watched. My So-Called Life. Yep. Yeah. You don't want me to say it, so you can say it. I really don't. Thank you. So take us through the plot of this show. So this episode irritated me, too. Like, I don't know if I'm just, like, in a mood this week, but, (laughs) like, Sharon's dad, this is um, Angela's old best friend. Right. Her dad has a heart attack. Yep. And the whole episode revolves around Sharon and Angela and their relationship or lack thereof. Mm. And again, and also how it affects her parents. Like, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And, but I mean, pretty much everything has to do with the fact that this, this man has had heart attack. So it's a catalyst for a lot of these things. Yeah. Yeah. So Sharon ends up, um, staying at their house while her mom is staying at the hospital. Mm. And, It's frustrating to watch because you can kind of tell, I mean, especially because, you know, we get her inner thoughts and stuff that Angela kind of wants to do something for her, but isn't comfortable enough, doesn't know what to do or how to handle it. Sharon just like passes out immediately. 
at at Angela's house. So yeah. she doesn't really get a chance to talk to her or be there for her then. And then, you know, she chooses to go to school, which I think is really bizarre. Like, everybody's giving her the option to be with her mom at the hospital or, you know, go to school. And she chooses school. Like, uh, there's no way in hell. Maybe it's like one of those things where, you know, people will throw themselves into their work. Maybe it's something like that. Yeah, I guess. But while she is at school, she'd been trying to reach her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And when she finally sees him, she's like, I left you five messages. You know what? What's been up? And and she says, I need you. And he just like runs the other direction. Yeah. He's like, fuck that. Basically. Yeah. I mean, it's just so terrible. Like terrible. So she's all like vulnerable and uh, crackhead is always lurking around, right? So <laughs> he, is, <laughs> he is like, like in that book, uh, the Lord of the Rings, like a golem, <laughs> right? So she's crying and sad because her boyfriend is not being there for her, and she ends up just going and hugging him, which like. You know, Angela should have freaking, like I said, when we're watching, Angela should have hugged her right away. Yeah, Angela was very, Angela was slightly distant. Right. Maybe that guy from the the ad would like her. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, no one has hugged this girl. Mm -hmm. She's staying at a house she doesn't even want to stay at with, you know, these people who she used to be close to. So that's got to be, like, uncomfortable and kind of, like, hurtful. Yeah, the whole and thing is weird. And then, you know, she goes to school looking for her boyfriend and he does he walks away from her. So yeah, Brian's there. He just happens to be the one that's there and he gets the hug. Yep. And finally, you know, he hugs her back and she's finally, you know, got somebody paying attention to her, so she just clings on to him. And uh it's kind of weird. Like the whole rest of the episode, she's all about Brian, like, hey, I'll see you on the bus. And mm -hmm. then he comes over to hang out with her at Angela's house, which is really weird. Yep. So then Brian and Sharon are in her room hanging out. Like, what the hell? Um, then the parents are going through all kinds of stuff because it's like they're best friends with this couple. Yeah. And the dad is, like, identifying with um, Sharon's dad, like, thinking, you know, this could happen to me. We're the same age. And, you know. Basically, he starts having a midlife crisis. Yeah. Because... They're 40. He is in a situation he doesn't want to be in. He doesn't like his job. He doesn't like working for his wife. He doesn't like what he's doing. And he says, you know, this guy could have a heart attack. I mean, he's like, we're not supposed to be having heart attacks. He's, I think he's starting to realize how old he is, right. basically. And, you know, he's freaked out about it. So, yeah, I mean, like, there's some big account they're trying to land that's kind of like a, a thing throughout the episode. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it kind of culminates to, to he lands the account and realizes that he didn't want to because it's not what he wants for his life. Right, exactly. And he he tells his wife that, so she ends up firing him. Yep. Because she wants him to be happy because she doesn't want to lose him. So she's smart, you know. I mean, he obviously was having problems where he wasn't happy in their marriage, which mm -hmm. is why he was almost cheating on her. Right. And, you know, somehow they managed to work through that, and now he's not happy in their career. And, you know, she's just doing whatever she can to make him happy. Yeah, because apparently she does need him. Yeah, that's the thing that, you know, she was talking to her friend, and... Her friend said, I'm not like you. I need my husband. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which, you know, that kind of freaked her out. That was weird, too. Like, she wanted to, like, have sex with him in the hospital. Yep. What? Where were they? A storage closet? Like, I, have, I don't know. <laughs> she just pulled him into a room and started trying to have sex with yeah, him. Yeah, like, like a corner. Just a corner right? of the hospital. <laughs> um, and he pushed her away, which was not really cool, but whatever. I don't know. I think they're they're going to be okay, but he's got to figure out what he wants to do with his life now. Yeah, exactly. He's untethered. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, what what do we know about him so far? He likes he likes to cook and he likes other women. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I guess we'll see. We'll see what happens with him, but um Angela uh is not really the focal point of this episode. It's really more Sharon. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
she's kind of separated from everybody right now because like her friends are are trying to be there for Sharon Mm -hmm. and she's avoiding her, I guess. I mean like Ray Ann's jealous because she thinks that, that her and, and Angela are becoming friends again. Right. Which they're not. So she ends up kind of becoming friends with her. Like they already have a little bit of a friendship going. Yeah. It's their relationship is weird. Yeah. But I mean like they could all just be friends. You would think. Like, I don't understand why Sharon just doesn't become part of their little group. You yeah, know, who else Who else is Sharon hanging out with? Other than her boyfriend, nobody. Right. And, you know, three is a very unstable number, so. Is, is it? <laughs> yeah. Three is, three is like, the worst number for a group. I thought it was the best. Okay, we're not talking about a menage. No, I'm just saying triangle and everything. I, I don't know. No, three is a very unstable number. You you always want at least four people. Really? Yeah. Where do you get that from? Um, you know, books. Okay. <laughs> Things that I have read and learned. Sure. Um, anyways, um, Rayanne and Ricky take, and do they get Tino to take her to the hospital to be with her mom? Yeah, I guess so. And Angela's just like, yeah, no, I've cut enough school. I'm going to stay. <laughs> like bitch you know um and then that night sharon's boyfriend calls the house looking for her and she well brian is over visiting and she just makes a date and agrees to go see him yeah which is really crappy yeah she really used brian in this episode which i did not like no i don't like sharon much at all anyway Really? See, you said that. I don't know why. Like, other than this episode, I haven't had much of a problem with her. She seems really stuck up and, I don't know, just very judgy. Well, I mean, she is a little stuck up and judgy, I guess, which is probably why Angela's not really good friends with her anymore, but... Yeah. I don't know. She, um, Angela gets mad at her for using Brian and actually stands up for Brian and then they have this big fight, her and Sharon, about it. But at the at the end of the episode, Sharon's dad's going to be okay. Angela goes to bring her back her bag, and they, like, relive childhood memories and end up crying and hugging again. They like to cry and talk. Yeah, they you, can... you liked to cry when we were watching. Shh. That was personal. <laughs> <laughs> I shed no tears. Okay. No, I did a little bit, but. I mean, it is sweet. Like, I mean, I remember what it was like to, you know, be super close when you're kids and oh yeah you know yep so i mean they do care about each other that's kind of that the the moral of that story right maybe maybe going forward they will be friends now i don't know we'll see they, they've they got a complicated relationship just like the parents do right <laughs> yeah i mean and and jordan was barely in this either Is that like one scene yeah angela was like crying under the bleachers and he was smoking under the bleachers, and then she, like, hugged him like, like, what's-her-face hug Krakow. Yeah, and then he disengaged almost instantly. Well, his friend showed up. His friends are always there. It's kind of weird. Did they have sex? No. Okay. What, why would you think that? I don't know. I thought I remembered that they had sex or something. Wow, were you dreaming? Like, they made out once. Oh, well, they kissed. That's it. Yeah. They're not really dating or anything. No. It's still kind of shitty what he did, but yeah, not as bad as I was thinking it was. What did, what do you mean? What did he do? That he wasn't like, he, he just was like, Hey, peace out. See ya. I guess. But I mean, again, his friends are always there. Like when she last episode, when she went up to him in the hall Mm -hmm. to, you know, ask him on a date, basically his friends were there staring at them, waiting, rushing him. Oh, that's right. She never wanted to talk to him again. Right. Because he didn't show up, but now she's hugging him. Because she was there crying and he was there smoking. Oh, okay. It's a crackhead situation. Gotcha. Yep. <laughs> so it's all it's awkward. It's a regular crackhead situation. It's just all kinds of awkward relationships everywhere. And you, Ricky was wearing, like, really, really pink lipstick this episode. Yeah, it was fine. See, I knew he had eyeliner before, but I never knew he wore lipstick. Do you think, is that new? Probably. Okay. If you didn't notice it, I'm guessing. Well, you know, sometimes you notice stuff that I don't. <laughs> it could happen. Yeah, I guess occasionally. So that was uh, my so-called life this week. Yeah, 
an interesting episode, I guess. It gives us a little more characterization of some of the people. Yeah. But all in all, not their best episode. No, not their best episode, but I liked it. I, I like all the episodes so far. It's a good show. I like the show. And I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious to see what's going to happen next. Well, that is the mark of a good show. Right. But it can keep your interests like that. And the mark of a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to talk about this is one. apparently being directed by this dude. Uh, what's his name? Quentin Tarantino. Don't you love that name? That's such a cool name. It is. a Yeah, it's an interesting name for sure. So we saw uh, a movie that's doing really well, actually, at the box office. Pulp Fiction. Such a great movie. It was very, very good. I will I will give it that. It's it's unique. It's a unique movie in a lot of different ways. So this this dude, Quentin Tarantino, who wrote and directed this movie, he did another movie called Reservoir Dogs, and we talked about the fact that he wrote the natural born killers mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting film. <laughs> and he's clearly a he's clearly a fan of European cinema. Okay. So especially I would say, you know, slightly older, maybe 70s European cinema because there are, there are a lot of techniques. So, we could really we're not going to, I don't think anyway, but we could really get super geeky from a film perspective <laughs> on this movie. Because there are a lot of techniques and there are a lot of things in this film. But I'll just say that the non-linear, non-linear style of narration that happens is a very European thing. Okay. And the other thing that makes this unique is the dialogue. The dialogue is... There are some, there are some screenwriters... And some writers just in general that have an ability, they have, they have just, they have a great ear for dialogue and they can like Elmore Leonard is, is one for instance, that just knows how to make dialogue sound sort of believable, but also incredibly interesting Right. because most dialogue in everyday life isn't that interesting. And so you can't just literally translate what people are saying to the page and make it sound, you know, sound cool and, and you have an interest to people. You have to give it, it has to be like it's real, but with a little bit of something else. Okay. And he does that in a way, in a very unique way. He has a very unique style of dialogue. I'm so obviously if you haven't seen the film, I would I would pause this tape now, go out to the theater, see the movie, then come back and resume listening to this because there are things that happen in the movie that you're not going to want spoiled for you. And we're going to go through the whole thing. Yeah. You definitely have to experience the movie, but at the very beginning, it's John Travolta playing Vincent Vega and Samuel L. Jackson mm-hmm. playing Jules. But that's not the very, very beginning. Okay, well, the very, very beginning is... I can't remember the guy's name. Honey Bunny. But the English actor. And... Timothy Roth, maybe, or something like that? I don't know. But... Anyway. But yeah, so it's it's him and it's those two. And yeah, they're talking about how robbing banks is better than what they're doing but robbing restaurants would be even better. So that I guess they're, like, they're criminals that rob liquor stores and that they should rob this restaurant. They can get all the wallets and it's they're not expecting it. The place is insured, all this stuff. Yep. So yeah, that's how it, that's the very, very beginning of it is them starting to hold up this di- hold, hold up the diner. But, you know, the big, the, yeah, I guess, okay, yeah. I mean, that does count as the beginning, because that, that is an interesting conversation as well. 
it's a little bit more normal, I guess, but it's also and it's sort of stylized as well. But the the real the conversation that really grabs you, like really pulls you into the movie, is the two actors that I named as Jules and Vincent, and mm-hmm. they're going to an apartment, and as they're going to this apartment. To do a job, they're clearly mob type people. They're having a conversation, and this conversation is about one of their associates who got thrown out of the of the fourth story apartment that he lived in by their boss because he gave the boss's wife a foot massage. <laughs> and this conversation about the foot massage is so interesting and funny and believable from these two characters Mm -hmm. and part of it's the acting but a lot of it is the writing the writing is just really solid and it's not it's not anything you see in movies usually this is way different than any other movie i've seen to this point okay you don't you don't agree I mean, I, it's really good writing. It's really, I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong about that, but just like, I don't know that it's just so, so different. Okay. Well, I, I, what, what other movie that's come out before this is like this? What other movie that's come out before this has, is in like a, a kind of a genre E film like this that has this kind of dialogue? I don't know. I, I, I don't have any, anything in mind to, refute your point so, so you're just disagreeing to i'm disagree? just disagreeing to disagree <laughs> i am that's me that's what i do so anyway but yeah that's i think that's the strength that's the main strength of this movie i think is the the, the writing the dialogue yeah the directing's good too the directing and the cinematography you know are good and like i said there are a lot of you know techniques being used here but the writing is really really rock solid so, from here, uh, they, you know, he, the the John Travolta's character, Vincent Vega, reveals that the reason he's so curious about what happened and everything is because the boss has asked him to take out the the woman to, the, that night, and the his wife, the woman, well, yeah. The, yeah, the boss's boss's name is Marcellus. Marcellus Wallace and, and Mia, Mia Wallace. Mia, yeah. So Mia played, played by Uma Thurman. Yeah, Uma. <laughs> so, yeah, he he needs to take out Mia Wallace uh, for a night on the town. So he's you know scared about that. I guess. <laughs> I just I don't understand why like why Marcellus Wallace decides hey let me have this dude take out my wife for the night. It's a very like nineteen fifties thing. You know, I'm busy, entertain my wife for the night kind of thing. Why Why can't she entertain herself? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's a very 50s thing. So you think in the 50s a guy would ask his buddy to take his wife out? Yeah. What? I think that happened. Okay, well, I think that Marcellus Wallace is an idiot. I mean, she is a pretty girl, and Vincent is an attractive guy. I and guess. I mean, I don't know that I agree with either of those statements, but go ahead. We see where it could have gone. Sure. And it just, I I feel like it was a setup almost. Was he testing them? Like, what what the hell? Do you get the idea that that Mia Wallace would have done anything, though? Because I don't. I don't know. I mean, he's in the bathroom talking himself down, basically. But should we maybe. Back up a little bit. And get sure, to that sure. So, yeah, he, he, we've learned that he's come back from Amsterdam. And, yeah, he's been there for about three years. And he's, you know, experienced the culture over there and, and everything else. And they came there to get something of their bosses, something that's gold in, in a briefcase. <laughs> we never see what it is, but it doesn't really matter. And I guess these three guys were trying to keep it or whatever, but they end up getting killed by the by the two hitmen. And then so and like I said, everything's sort of shot out of order. So that's kind of where that ends. And then we pick up with the Mia Wallace thing. And 
So it's later that night and he's going to take her out. So he, beforehand, he buys some heroin because he's a high level heroin addict, I guess. High level, yeah. He, bu- he buys this, the, like the best kind for $1,500. $1,500 worth of heroin. Know, that's a lot of that's heroin. That's insane. And so he, you know, he does some before he goes to drive and picks her up. He goes and drives and picks her up. And then they go to a, what's it called? Jackrabbit Slim's which is like a 50s-style diner. She says, this bothers me, too. She says, come on, don't be a... And then she does the the finger, you know, like square, makes a right. square with her fingers. And hyper-realistically, for whatever reason, this is the, this is the only thing that's unrealistic about the entire movie, a, you know, a figure appears, like with dotted lines as she does it, but she makes a rectangle. She does. That is not a square. It's a <laughs> rectangle. Yeah. So that bothers me. I'm I'm sorry that her 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 uh, square was off. <laughs> so they go to this this diner and they have a conversation. And that's the uh, that's the other thing too is most of this movie is conversations. It is. Yeah. Which is a unique thing about this kind of you know it's supposed to be a crime kind of thrillerish action movie but most of it is talking okay which is i think is wonderful yeah it is and it is different you're right and so they you know like they have this conversation they get to know each other a little bit better we get to know their characters really well she orders a five dollar milkshake <laughs> which he he comments on that is an insane amount of money for a milkshake oh hell yes especially because they buy a pack of cigarettes for a dollar 25 right so we're talking four times the amount of money to buy that milkshake right exactly but anyway so he they they talk about how she used to be she was on a pilot for a tv show and he, he kind of, he doesn't really say much about himself. He talks about no. how, how he was in Amsterdam and everything. But he mentions the story about the guy that Marcellus threw from the window. And she says, she basically says that didn't, that didn't happen. He threw him from the window, but he never gave me a foot massage. I don't know where, why you people think that. Right. But. The only people that know why that happened is Tony and Marcellus. But she does admit that it happened. Oh, yeah. Which is interesting. So I'm thinking that Tony must have screwed over Marcellus in some other way. She even goes so far as to say the only time that that man had touched her was to shake her hand at her wedding. Right. So, I mean, it is it is a really weird jump to, to think that it had anything to do with her. Yeah, I don't know where that came from exactly, but... As she said, when you scamps get together, you're worse than a sewing circle. Yeah. <laughs> so she they, they have a, a, a twist contest at this place, and Mia wants to win. So they go and dance. It's basically an excuse for John Travolta to dance once again on film. Right. Which, you know, admittedly is, is lovely. He's it was a, cool. He's a good dancer. And the little eye thing... You know, is <laughs> is pretty fun. It's, it's an easy thing to do when you're dancing, right? So that's gonna catch on, I'm sure. Yeah, it was it was fun to watch. But then they 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 win the contest. They go home. He goes to the bathroom, like you said. So now go ahead. He's talking himself. Well, no, down. when they when they well when they walk in, right? They're being all goofy. First of all, we haven't even talked about the fact she's high as a kite. Cause yeah, she does. She, cocaine. she does cocaine before they leave and at the restaurant, right? In the bathroom. He had done heroin on the way to pick her up. So, right. I mean, they're both feeling good. Um, but I think she's more so. and Because she's more recently high. Right. Yeah. And, well, I mean, she just seems kind of goofy. Right. <laughs> like, they come in and they're, like, dancing and being silly and stuff. And they had been talking about uncomfortable silences earlier. Mm-hmm. So, they kind of get into this, like, they could kiss moment. And he's like, is that what they call an uncomfortable silence? She's like, I don't know what you call that. Right. So, I mean, that's leaving a lot hanging out there for right. when he goes to the bathroom. Yeah. And then, yeah, he's in the bathroom talking himself down. You're just going to have a drink. You're going to say goodbye. Like, no big deal. 
And um, you're saying, do I think she would have done anything? I mean, I think he definitely would have. Oh, of course. Yeah, I think he would have for sure. Um, I think it's possible. I I don't know why you think she wouldn't. I think she was just being flirty. I don't think she'd actually cheat on Marcellus. I don't know. I mean. Although it seems like Marcellus is cheating on her. It does? Where do you get that? Did you ever catch that? No. So later in the movie, uh, Jules has to call Marcellus, right? Uh Uh-huh. And Marcellus is sitting poolside. Right. And talking to him, basically calming him down. A woman walks up from the pool and sits down. That's not Mia. Yes, it is. It is? Yeah, she was wearing a swim cap, so you couldn't tell. But yeah, that's her. That's Uma Thurman. Oh, okay. Forget it then. (laughs) I guess he's not. Yeah, no. Um, So he's loyal to. But I just, I don't know, because she is stoned and because they were being flirty, I feel like it's possible. I guess maybe it's possible. Because, I mean, what else are they, why why is he even, like, back in the house? Like, this is the say goodnight and leave. But that's not what's happening. He should have just said goodnight, yeah. So, then, um, you know, you can talk about what happens next. Okay, so, (laughs) she puts his coat on, and she's sitting there and kind of playing around with all his stuff. Yeah, she steals a cigarette. Rude. And reaches into his pocket and finds a baggie. Yep. Which I guess she assumes is cocaine. Now, who just helps themselves to someone else's drugs? Clearly she has a stash, too, by the way. Right. That she could just dip into. Why is she taking this guy's stash? Yeah, that's kind of nuts. So, and I mean, I'm assuming she thought it was cocaine. I guess there's room for interpretation that maybe she knew it was heroin, but thought that it was, you know, just regular street-level heroin that she could snort. Uh, But because it was such high quality, and, you know, he's obviously built up a high tolerance for for heroin, that she couldn't handle it. Can you snort heroin, though? Yes. Oh. See, I just assumed that she... What was wrong was that she shouldn't have snorted it in the first place because it's heroin. I didn't realize that it was just because it was strong heroin. No, you can absolutely snort uh, heroin. Oh. But I, um, yeah, I, I mean, there's room for interpretation of that, but I think she thought it was cocaine. And I think the movie is trying to say that she thinks it's cocaine. I think if you were a really frequent cocaine user, you probably wouldn't mistake heroin for cocaine. Right. But... You could, I suppose. And I'm guessing Quentin Tarantino is not a heroin or cocaine addict. I would guess that. So he well. probably doesn't know. But anyway, so she snorts it and she is all the way fucked up. Oh my God. Yeah. So overdosed. as fucked up as you can be because her and eye, still be ble- breathing. Her, her yeah. eyes are half slits. She's got milk of magnesia coming out of her mouth. Ugh. It's basically, you know, it's like her, she's like foaming at the mouth and she is severely overdosing blood all down her face. So, uh, John Travolta is unhappy about this situation. Of course. So he takes her to his drug dealer (laughs) played by Eric Stoltz and says she's dying. You know, she's Marcellus's wife. If you don't help me, I'll be forced to tell him that you were no help in this situation. Right. So he brings her in the house and he's got an adrenaline shot that he wants her, he wants John Travolta to stab into her chest and push the plunger down. It's a very tense moment. Oh, yeah. But not how you would do this at all. (laughs) So the adrenaline is basically epinephrine which is for severe allergic reactions. Now, I don't know exactly when medically you'd pump it into the heart. I know they have uh, intercardiac injections, and they have cardiac needles, which is a real long needle, which is what that was. Right. But I don't know. I can't remember exactly. I know there are conditions that, that would require that. I'm not sure exactly which ones they are. Well, I mean, wouldn't they use it just like if someone's heart stops to bring them back? 
Maybe. Because that's, I mean, I think that's what that was more or less supposed to do. Well, it opens up the lung passages and everything, too. It does a lot of stuff, even injected directly into the cardiac muscle. So, yeah. But but there's a drug called naloxacan or Mm -hmm. or, or naloxone, which is an opioid antagonist, basically. And it kind of neutralizes the effects of opiates in the bloodstream. And that's what you would use. Which is why the drug dealer was telling him to take her to the hospital. Right. That was isolated in 1961. So, you know, that's, I mean, obviously it's not something you can just pick up at a drugstore. Right. But, but hospitals presumably would have it. So, I mean, yeah, that would have been a better treatment, but I, I, I'm not convinced that the epinephrine wouldn't do anything. All right. I mean, I, I don't mean, know. I'm not an expert, so. Neither am I. But I just, I don't think that it was 100% like, oh, this is so terrible and wrong. So anyway, so after that, <laughs> that's it, that storyline's kind of done. Each one of the, they, so each section of this movie sort of, of acts like its own little vignette, basically. But they all do come together. Right. So I think after that one is when we we meet Butch. Yeah. Right. And Butch has been paid to throw a fight to lose in the fifth round. He's a boxer. He has a dream or memory or memory dream or whatever about Christopher Walken coming to his house and telling him about his dad who died in a POW camp in the Vietnam War. Christopher Walken is fantastic in this movie. Just absolutely a delight in this role. It just he gets one scene with one monologue, but it's so memorable. Yeah. Um I don't know. This whole scene just bothers me. What bothers you about it? I mean it's great, it's well done, but it's just so nasty. <laughs> Why? Because of where the watch was. So that's okay, that's the only thing you took out of that? It's it's all great, fantastic acting, whatever. But yes, I mean, I'm sorry. I wouldn't want it. I love that he says he wore this watch up his ass. Right? <laughs> that's, not, that's not a phrase you typically hear. <laughs> and then he died of dysentery. Do you, do you think that means the watch made him ill? Yes. Wow. The fact that he continually crapped the swatch out and then put it back in and then crapped it out and put it back in. Yes, that's that's why he got dysentery. So he killed himself to keep this watch. Correct. Wow. Which is why it's important to Butch. Ugh. So Butch decides not to throw the fight and in fact kills his opponent in the ring. Do you think he decided? To kill the guy? Yeah. No. No. I think he decided to win... And he just unfortunately happened to kill the guy. I don't think he meant to kill the guy at all. Well, I mean, he obviously decided to win ahead of time. Yes. Because he was supposed to throw the game or the the fight. Yes. He was supposed. What? The game. <laughs> well, it's all sports. Yeah. he was The boxing game was supposed to be <laughs> match <laughs> or bout. Right. So, but I mean, he knew he wasn't going to because didn't he have other bets or something? And that's where he was getting money from. Yeah. So he said on the phone after this, once word got out that the fix was in, the odds changed, I guess. Right. So he was able to bet a lot of money on himself at very long odds because all the bookmakers knew that the fix was in. So they adjusted their odds accordingly. How did they know? I just... Rumor mill, I guess, hmm. you know, like the, the, the whole point was, is that probably once Marcellus, uh, or, or his associates place a large bet on this other guy who's a long shot, right? then they're like, okay, we understand it's, it's going to be, you know, it's, it, it's going to be, um, you know, a fix because Marcellus is the one that does these, these kind of fixes. You know, the, the biggest winner here is, are the bookies. Right. Because they took huge bets from Marcellus and his people 
and then huge bets from Bruce Willis, and they'll basically use Marcellus's money to pay Bruce Willis off, and they collect all that commission. Yeah, that's true. So the bookies really made out this time. <laughs> but, so, yeah, he, uh, you know, he accidentally kills the guy. It's basically implied that the guy was too old to fight, so I'm guessing he had a lot of hits to the head, and this was just one too many. Hemorrhaged or whatever, you know. It's kind of sad. Yeah, absolutely. But... So he goes and uh, he goes to his French girlfriend, who I hate. Fabian. Yeah, she's so annoying. Why? She's the most annoying character in this movie filled with murderers. <laughs> because she's just, I want a pot. I want a little pot belly. <laughs> and can we move to Polynesia and... Oh, you are, you look like an oaf. Oh, don't be, don't use that voice. Oh, oh, I forgot your watch. You know, it's just like, is she so like cutesy and stupid and ah, I just hate it. <laughs> she is annoying. I just wanted to hear you rant. But so she forgets his watch and he's like, it's the only thing I fucking care about in the world. Why didn't you bring the watch, Butch? Right. He's like, oh, I had all these other things to carry. Put the watch in your fucking pocket. It's a watch. It's not an anvil. I gotta say, though, I was kind of impressed with Butch and the fact that he was that upset. Mm -hmm. And he calmed himself down so quickly and to the point of being able to say it's not your fault and then taking the responsibility at all. You know, like, he went from, like, I want to murder you to it's not your fault real fast. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's an impressive uh, switch of years. Yeah, I guess. So he goes back to his apartment to get the watch like an idiot. Yeah. And guess who's there? Vincent Vega. But Vincent Vega's in the bathroom and he's left his gun on the kitchen counter like a moron. Yeah. So Butch picks it up. He uh, aims it at the bathroom door. Vincent Vega comes out. Vincent Vega dead. You know, it's so funny, though, because... The only reason he even saw the gun and was able to kill Vincent is because he stopped the fucking Pop-Tarts. Yeah, who, what desperate asshole on the run is going to eat some strawberry Pop-Tarts? Right, and and to stop to heat them up. Like, just yeah. take it with you. Grab the package and eat on the run. Yep, absolutely. You're in a hurry, you idiot. So, yeah, that happens, and then he goes out and sees Marcellus Wallace, and... <laughs> was out getting coffee and donuts for for them basically my assumption is wallace likes vincent a lot that's his boy right right so he's like okay me and my favorite guy we're gonna you know stake out the apartment where we know he's not coming because he's not that big of an idiot who is right while all of you you know are doing all this other stuff so they're taking the easy detail that's my opinion and because Vincent had to go to the bathroom, he's like, well, I'll go out and get the coffee and donuts and stuff. Right. Also, by the way, heroin makes you constipated. So it's it, it makes sense that Vincent goes to the bathroom so much in this movie. Because it's like he's just, he's like, you know, he's just trying. So much. But it's not happening. He went to the bathroom three times. Yeah, but he's he keeps thinking like, okay, you know, this is, this is going to work out. And it, and it doesn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's my that's my feeling. Um, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, so anyway, he uh, Butch sees him and runs him over, <laughs> and then they chase each other, limping after a horrific car accident, and they get into this. What was it like a pawn shop? Maybe. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it was a pawn shop. That makes sense. And this guy pulls out a shotgun and says, get off the N-word. That, that word gets used a lot. Yeah, it does. In this movie, by the way. And so they they chain him up downstairs in the basement, tie him up and everything. Yeah, you think that he's interfering to, like, stop to help yeah, but initially. No. But no, he just wants to keep them both for himself. Yeah, and his buddy Zed. Zed. Who, who he calls. Zed looks like one of those, I mean, that's like, he's creepy looking because he, he looks almost like that dude from the Silence of the Lambs, but he's like, he's a very smooth boy, <laughs> you know, yeah. just, just very smooth and slick and just, I don't know, disturbing looking. Yeah, I agree. So 
Uh, he does the eeny, meeny, miny, mo thing, which a lot of people don't realize has racist connotations because the way the guy says it with uh, that word is the way it was originally said. Yeah, I had no idea until you told me that. So he picks uh, Marcellus, big black guy, to go first, which we're not sure what that means yet. Uh, before then, they pull out... The, we find out pretty quick. Yeah. Before then, they pull out the gimp, which is just a guy in uh, leather... And with a, you know, his mouth is zippered shut. Who apparently sleeps in a cage in a box. Yeah. In this room. So they pull him out and say, hey, he's all, he's chained to the ceiling. And he says, watch this guy. And he just like maniacally laughs as he's watching Bruce Willis, Butch. Mm-hmm. I, that, you'd have to be nuts at that point, right? Like if you've been there for months or years or however long he's been held captive you're just insane at that point, right? Do you think that he's being held captive? Yes. Because, I mean, maybe he he's just, like, into this. Maybe he's, like, you know, being the submissive dude? I don't know. I think he's a captive. I guess. I mean, it just they seem, like, very murderous. It seems weird they would keep someone so long. I guess. I don't know. Although, I mean, we have no indication that they would have killed either one of them, really. Yeah, maybe they'd be other gimps. Ugh. But, so, a butch gets out, the gimp, you know, reacts and tries to call them, but his mouth is zippered shut. He punches him in the face, knocks him out, which makes sense because he's a boxer. Right. So, he goes up to leave and then he's like, nah, I can't, even I can't turn a blind eye to what's going on here. Because we're hearing it in the background. We are hearing him being raped. It is just terrible. Right. So... He goes up, it's like a video game where he he finds a hammer and he's like, oh, weapon upgrade, a bat, Uh, weapon upgrade, a chainsaw, and then the final weapon upgrade, a samurai sword, which he picks up and proceeds to murder the owner of the pawn shop. And then, you know, he's got the, the knife to Zed's throat and says, or the sword to Zed's throat. And Zed's looking at his gun. He's like, yeah, go ahead, get in, pick up, pick up that gun. I want you to, you know. And then Marcellus Wallace has stood up now, and he's like, move aside, Butch. And he shotgun shoots him in the testicles, <laughs> which is the best. And then basically says, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call some of my friends over here, and we're going to get to work on you with some t- torches or blow torches and pliers. Yep. So his, the rest of his life is not looking too good. (laughs) And he basically says to Butch, hey, you know what? We're even. You're cool. But get the fuck out of L.A. and never come back. Now, I still think, though, once he realizes that Butch killed Vincent, that he might feel differently. I mean, I know he saved him. He saved his life. He stopped him from being raped. But he also killed his boy. I don't think he's going to come after him. But, I mean, if they want to make a sequel, Butch's Bounty or something, <laughs> then they can go ahead and do that. But. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, that's basically the end of that story. They they leave, and then we pick up with what happened after they shot the dude at the beginning of the movie. So, we go there, and there's a dude in the bathroom that we previously did not know about. He comes out and starts shooting at them, but doesn't hit them at all. Yeah, it's very weird. And if you look, if you notice, when they when they part, they move, and, and Jules turns around and looks at the wall behind them, the bullet holes are where they were standing. For sure. Like, the bullets went through them. Through and them, then around them. Lodged into the wall somehow. Yeah. Very weird. So Jules calls it a miracle. And Vincent says, nah, that's nah, <laughs> just one of those things that happens. So a lot of like there, like I said, there's a lot we get into about this movie, but it seems like there are signs throughout this film and Jules is picking up on the signs now. And Vincent is keeping a blind eye. Yeah. Which is why eventually Vincent dies and Jules doesn't. Yeah. So, they, uh, you know, they, they take Marvin along with them, who is the black guy 
in the apartment that let them in because they never knocked. He just let them in at some preordained time because, you know, when they're having their conversation at the beginning of the movie, Jules is like, oh, it's not quite time yet. And so <clears throat> they take him along with him. They start talking and everything. And John Travolta is talking with him, being very casual with his gun. They hit a bump and he blows Marvin's face off. Yep. It's just, it, it's not even like graphic, really. I can't even, like, it's it's a, it's a graphic and the, like there's a ton of blood. But I can't even really call it graphic more, it's more funny because it's just. Oh, yeah. It's like he's there and then, because you don't see his head blow up or anything. It's like someone, re- it's like someone set off a blood bomb in the back because <laughs> it's just he's there. Then there's a bump. The camera kind of shakes a little bit. And then the back is just filled with blood. I literally laughed out loud. And I'm not one that laughs when people get hurt or things like that. But it's funny. Well, it's especially funny because John Travolta goes, man, I shot Marvin in the face. Right. <laughs> just so casually. <laughs> yeah. And so their car is filled with blood and, you know, it's not good. Obviously, they're going to get pulled over. Yeah, it's the middle of the day. Well, it's like the morning, actually. It's, yeah. it's early in the morning. Yeah, still. It's, it's like eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so they have to drive to a friend's house played by Quentin Tarantino. Oh, I didn't know that was Quentin Tarantino. Yeah, yeah. He's also in uh, Reservoir Dogs, the other movie he did. So I've seen that movie uh, hmm. before as well. And that's that's him. That's what he looks like. Okay. So he is, you know, not happy. He's like, you know, <laughs> my wife comes home. She's going to freak out, so you got to take care of this soon. So that's when the other scene stealer in the movie comes in. They call up Marcellus Wallace, and he says he's sending the wolf, which is Winston Wolf, played by Harvey Keitel. He comes in, and, you know, he, he he's a fast-talking kind of, we're going to solve this problem kind of guy, where he's like, you do this, you do this, you do this. You know, he's very just, like, methodical. He's got all the answers, and, uh, you know, he's a real quick, punctual kind of guy. It, which is, it's fantastic. And it's funny because not a lot happens in this section of the movie, but it's maybe my favorite section of the movie. Oh, really? Yeah, where he just kind of goes through all of his, all of the procedure type stuff. And he's like, you're going to, you know, you got to clean this, this car out. We're going to get a bunch of linens. We're going to camouflage the car and make it look good. We're going to take it to this place I know. Where this guy's going to help us dispose of this body. And then, you know, you'll be, you'll be fine. And that's, I mean, that's basically what happens. Yeah. I can't really think of anything else to say about this section of the movie. No, it just, it has more uh, interesting conversation, I would say. Yeah. I mean, just the, the banter, the back and forth that they all have is good. So then they go to the diner that we see at the beginning of the movie. They're talking about what's happening. And Jules is basically saying, I'm going to retire. I'm going to walk the earth and meet people, have adventures, this kind of thing. I'm out of this mobster life. And John Travolta's like, you're an idiot. He goes to the bathroom. Every time he goes to the bathroom in this movie, something bad right? happens. <laughs> he goes to the bathroom. Mia Wallace over- overdoses on heroin. He goes to the bathroom, gets murdered. He goes to the bathroom and then this happens. So then the robbery that we see at the beginning happens and they come over and they, they take, uh, you know, the wallets and everything. They want to take the briefcase and you know, he's, It's funny because he goes, is that what I think it is? And he says, yeah, you know, he's like, it's beautiful. I I don't know what it's supposed to be. We don't know what it is. Nobody knows. But then, then Samuel L. Jackson grabs him and he's got a gun and points at him. And then it's like a Mexican standoff. So he basically has him sit down and and then we get, you know, another great monologue where Samuel L. Jackson talks about what his place in the world is. And what every, you know, what, what the other people's place in the world is. And he says, you know, I really want to be the shepherd. I want to be a good person basically is what he's saying. And so he gives him his money from his wallet, keeps his wallet though. Cause he wants his ID and everything and has them go. And then that's basically where the movie ends. Yeah. And it's, well, he, he it's tells him fantastic. <laughs> He tells him that he's buying his life. Yeah. That he, he wants, he's giving him this $1,500 and he wants him to like do something with his life. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot to it. There's a lot 
to this movie and the religious and the spiritual and you know everything they're going through. Yeah. So, what do you think? You got thoughts about this? Um. Well, I mean, I I, I agree with what you had said that you know it's Vincent shouldn't have said it wasn't a miracle right yeah for sure (laughs) i think i think that was definitely uh the beginning of of his mistakes um so i'm just i mean you know and the way everything in this movie happens out of order Mm -hmm. i'm trying to think about it now so the mia thing happens after the end of the movie correct basic so this is the basic order they go in there they kill the the dude to get marcellus's thing back the guy shoots at them. Uh, they go with Marvin, shoots Marvin in the face accidentally. They go and clean the stuff up. Then they go to the diner. It gets robbed. They go from there to Marcellus's place, give him his briefcase back. Then that's probably where what's his face leaves. Yeah. Where, where Samuel, Samuel L. Jackson yeah. leaves. Yeah. And then Jules. And then that night he takes Mia Wallace out. It's that night. Okay. And then that happened. So Vincent had a really fucking bad day. Yeah. And then the next day he wow. gets killed. Wow. What a, that is a lot of stress. I mean, yeah. his morning starts out like that. Then his evening ends with her overdosing. Yep. In the middle, he goes and buys that heroin. I'm assuming that's yep. what he did with the middle of his day. Correct. And, and then, then the next day he gets shot to death. The next day he gets shot. Wow. That is that is bad. Yeah, so that's his storyline. But if we had seen it like in in order like that, I can see why shooting it out of sequence, or or, or not shooting it out of sequence, but but having it be, be presented out of sequence, really, it, it it's very effective. It's a very effective way to make this movie. Yeah, I, I like it, and um, I like too that because I think that having uh, jewels out of the movie like early would would not have been as good agreed yeah <laughs> um but you know and as far as like okay the briefcase right mm-hmm. uh, tell, tell tell your theory and then i'll tell my, like i i always just thought like i don't know i you said like there's the possibility of like it being like a soul right so yeah i heard a couple people talking about this you know uh around the theater and I talked to a couple of friends that have seen the movie that, that said they heard the same thing. Now, I don't know if I necessarily buy this, but there is a theory because when we first see, we see Marcellus Wallace mostly from the back. Yes, which we is don't, weird. We don't True. really see his face. But very prominently featured is the fact that he has a Band-Aid on the back of his head. And I guess there's some scripture or something in the Bible that alludes to the fact that if you sell your soul to the devil or the devil takes your soul or something like that, that he takes it from the back of the head. And the the lock, the combination lock on the the briefcase is 666, right? Which is the sign of the devil. And there's this weird glowing light and everything inside the case. So people theorize that what was in the case was his soul. And maybe those three guys somehow got the soul back from the devil or something like that. And they were supposed to deliver it to Wallace and they weren't going to, you know, or whatever. And I guess like, that's why, uh, what's his name? Uh, Roth says that it's beautiful and, and all this stuff and why it's got this glowing light to it. I mean, it's obviously not just cash. Right. You know, or it wouldn't look like that. How about if it was gold, though? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a possibility. I mean, that's that, that was my first thought when I saw them open the case and the golden light. Yeah, that it's just... Bars of gold. That it's just bars of gold. That they got and were supposed to deliver to him or something like that. And bars of gold could be beautiful. Yeah. Or maybe even like pirate treasure or something. Right. You know, like it's like gold doubloons and Uh, stuff, you know. Yeah, it could be that. Although I would imagine that it would like make a jingling sound if it was full of, you know, doubloons. I guess. I mean, how how heavy would a, a bunch of bars of gold be? True. It doesn't seem that heavy. Is gold heavy, though? Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Hmm. But, yeah, I don't know. 
But I don't really think it matters what it is. I guess. Whatever it is, it belongs to Marcellus Wallace. Yeah, I think that's the important part, is that it's Marcellus Wallace's. And it needs to get back to him. Exactly. So, that, uh, I mean, do you, any, you have any other thoughts about, about the movie? Well, I mean, just like, okay, what what's your favorite aspect of this movie? So, I think th- I think my two favorite aspects are Christopher Walken's part and Harvey Keitel's part. Harvey Keitel. Yeah, the uh, Winston Wolf. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can see why you like their characters the best. Um, they, I mean, they're very, like... Well, I think Jules was my favorite cool. character. Okay. But those two parts, I think, were the most interesting to me. Mm. What about you? I My favorite is... Uh, Vincent and uh, Mia. Yeah, that does not surprise me either. Why? Because that's that's the that's the love ish story part of the movie, so that doesn't surprise me that that's your favorite part. Well, there was also there was other there was more love ishness with uh, the little pot belly girl and uh, <laughs> Butch. Eh, that's annoying. I mean, though. would you give me oral pleasure? <laughs> right. But that was that was annoying more it than anything annoying. else. It was annoying. But yeah, no, I just, I really liked uh, watching. I guess there was a hell of a love story between Zed and Marcellus Wallace. Oh, God. That's not a love story. That's disgusting. Uh, uh, yeah. And the gimp. The gimp. Yeah, that whole situation is a movie of its, in its in and of itself. Yeah. I'll tell you, I, I did not enjoy that scene at all, though. Like, I just, I feel wronged having seen and heard it, and I wish I could, like, bleach my brain. It is the worst part of the movie. Yeah. But I mean, I I really enjoy the the whole movie. Yeah, it's very good, very very good film. So, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely go see it. But that is our episode for the day or the week or whatever you want to call it. We will end this episode as we end every episode with our blockbuster pick of the week, Carol. This week at Blockbuster, I'm not sure if you're aware of this film or not. This is an older film, 1986, so it is eight years old at this point, Mm -hmm. but it is just now coming to VHS. It's a movie called The Worst Witch. I have not heard of this or seen it. Uh, Okay, so it, it occasionally around Halloween, it will appear on, I believe, Disney Channel, because I'm pretty sure it's a Disney movie. Okay, so again, you have to have like cable for that. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. The Disney Channel is on cable. Don't have cable. So it stars Tim Curry from the It movie and Clue, which I love. Uh huh. As this, well, it doesn't star him, but he's he's featured in it. it. He's like this high warlock and everything. Basically, it's about a girl that goes to a school for witches. Okay. And it's an English movie. It takes like, you know, a lot of the characters are, are, or a lot of the people are English. I believe it was shot in England. Pretty sure it's mostly an English production. But she goes to a school for witches and she learns how to, you know, ride a broom, how to do spells and and things like that. But she's really bad. Like she's a big, she's like kind of like messes up a lot, right? Yeah. And the the big thing that's going to happen at the end of the year is Tim Curry. He's going to to join them and everything. But it's it's kind of a cute little movie for uh, for Halloween and everything. And you know we should definitely check it out. I think it's a good one. Okay. Well, I'm I'm open. I haven't seen it. Let's check it out. All right. Well, that is our show. Take it home, Carol. All right, everybody. If you like our show, tell people about it and keep listening and give us the you know stars and stuff. Da da da, the show is over. Da da da. Oh no. Da, da.